Man, I wish this film had audio description. Uh, I would love, I'd love to carry a torch for it. Um, I'm John Stark from MagnumMovieGuy.com, and this is my review of To Leslie. Um, as I've already acknowledged, it does not have audio description. It is available on iTunes. It's a little bit more expensive. I don't know, because they're poor. Um, and uh, <laughs> as a rental, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why they wanted that extra dollar out of me. Fine, I guess. Uh, weirdos. Um, but uh, this is... <laughs> This is a, a film that's been getting a lot of attention recently because its star, Andrea Riseborough, recently received a Best Actress nomination for a film that made about $30,000 at the box office and comes from a distributor that has in no way of the ability to launch an Oscar campaign, which led to Andrea having to pay for her own Oscar campaign and get the film. I understand that... Uh, at least what I've read in the trades and what I've heard from other people who seem to be in the know, it, they make it sound like she actually had to pay to submit the film for Oscar consideration to get it uploaded to, there's a, uh, like a site where Oscar voters can actually go to because we live in a streaming era. So you don't actually have to go. My God. Uh, back in the day, Harvey Weinstein had to actually convince people to show up to screenings. Now we just have to convince you to click on a film in the, in your Oscar portal, you know, <laughs> and watch it. <laughs> That's all you have to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that is... Uh, it's causing a lot of controversy. Um, and I don't really know why. I think it's causing the wrong kind of controversy. And I very much clap back against... Uh, when this when this whole thing came out um i don't think actors should be funding their own oscar campaigns i think there's something wrong about that and i and i think um and it's not because i think that uh it doesn't necessarily mean that the performance isn't warranted this is a very terrific performance from andrea riseborough and i can understand why she wants people to see the film but what it ends up doing is it centers a campaign around that one person. Instead of centering the campaign around the film, it centers it around the one person. So everybody ends up talking about just Andrea Riseborough. Nobody ends up talking about the screenplay. Nobody ends up talking about Mark Maron. Nobody ends up talking about, you know, I don't know, the cinematography. It's not really in equal consideration. It's only in consideration because Andrea Riseborough is making sure that she's seen not necessarily that anybody else is thinking about any other of the aspects of the film so um i think the fact that ampus is investigating this i think they're investigating it for all the wrong reasons while i i have a lot of thoughts about how the actors branch um can go fly a kite um, for uh, this perceived notion that Andrea Riseborough, who started acting in about 2006, has been overdue for a nomination, but somehow Dale Dickey, who's got a full decade on her, was not overdue for a nomination for the similarly underseen A Love Song, um, which also was not getting the same amount of awards attention. She has twice the amount of credits of Andrea Riseborough, and there was no Mary McCormick married her director that uh to champion her film and that's where we get kind of sketchy is uh but i mean honestly is that is that really like should that have been the deciding factor you know like um i don't know i don't know how much impact mary mccormick really does have on the entire actor's branch <laughs> so um i i I just, I think actors who have worked with other actors before, they inspire them to um, sort of go through the Rolodex and, and be like, oh yeah, oh, we worked together. Oh, you've got a performance. Yeah, you were great. I loved working with you. Let me let me watch your film. Oh, you're great, your film. Um, I just don't know why that didn't happen for Dale, because she has, again, 
twice the amount of credits that Andrea Riseborough has. And this is the first time she's really been given a starring role, like the lead role in a film based around her, where she's great. And not a single person stood up and said, hey, maybe we should watch a love song. I think what Ampus needs to do is they need to give all films equal consideration. It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't be the loudest film with the most money being thrown at it that wins or gets nominated. It should be the film that actually deserves it, that actually gets... I know that that's like wishful thinking, but I think that would stop a whole shit ton of people um, from getting upset every year because we keep snubbing performances because nobody's watching a, a smaller film. Andrea Riseborough should have been snubbed, just logistically, like every other small film that the Oscar voters have never watched. Somehow they watch this one, and for some reason, Ampus is just like their mind is blown because Andrew Riseborough actually got enough people to watch the film, which says to me a lot about who she is as an actress and how delightful she must be to work with on set. Uh, so congratulations to her. I'm not taking away anything from her. I think they need to create a portal that is easier for films to be submitted to so that that way, um, when you're going in to click and vote, you actually see all of these films and you actually have equal access and it's a lot easier to submit your film regardless of whether or not you have Buku's, you know, amount of money just to throw up in the air and submit every crappy thing that you've released this, in the, the entire year like a major studio can. Like, you know, Netflix can just make you watch everything that they've ever made the entire year and just submit everything because they have the money to do it. These smaller distributors, they don't have that ability. So we lose films like To Leslie, and we lose films like Last Year's Mass, and we lose films along the way that are all these beautiful but small films uh, that that everybody talks about and and champions. And we, we lose performances in smaller films that were great that nobody saw. And it's all because they don't have the backing. Um, they're not loud. They're not, um, they're not making the noise, you know. They didn't come out at the right time. They didn't go to the right festival. <laughs> you know, if Ampus really wants to create equality, they should look at To Leslie as being sort of a warning that the system is broken in Andrea's favor, not against her. She didn't do anything wrong. She found a way to break the system that should that needed to be broken so that people like her could get nominated instead of just people who come from the loudest film with the most well-known director from a major studio who's throwing $20 million into an Oscar campaign and then managed to open the film at a certain time of the year and platform it and slowly expand it into wide release. You know, I mean... Not everybody has that. They can't control when their studios release their films. They can't control whether or not their studio drops millions on an Oscar campaign. So a lot of performers get left behind. And a lot of and when performers get left behind, so do all the b below the line talent. So do the screenwriters. So do the cinematographers and the editors and the costumers and the production design and the, you know, just way on down. All of those people get left behind. So the, the equity needs to be there. That's all it is. That's what Andrea brought up. So I hate the fact that Ampus is investigating this whole thing because I feel like they're getting, they're getting the wrong thing out of this. It's like... <laughs> it's like going back to the days of like the civil rights movement, right? And you have like a whites-only establishment and somehow like a, a black man manages to to get his way in and we're like oh we have to figure out how did this happen <laughs> it's like well, no no that's that's what we should that's called progress that's uh you should you should we should be doing more of that not less of that <laughs> the answer to that question is not how do we how do we get this person out how do we remove this person how do we make sure this never happens again the question is we should probably be doing more of this and how do we be how do we bring more of this in here uh, and uh, that's what they need to be doing. We need more Andrea Riseboroughs, not less. So, 
Uh, but this film needs audio description. So, um, Andrea, since you have tons of money, why don't you pay for audio description for your film so that blind people can watch it and enjoy it? This film has tons. <laughs> I just stood up for you. So uh, now I get to say, fuck you in your film. Uh, tons of scenes uh, for... <laughs> <laughs> where it's like nothing no dialogue I have no idea what's going on there's just like these long scenes where I I don't know what the camera's looking at no, I got nothing um they don't really seem to be that important but uh it, my my answer to that would be if there's nothing important then why are we showing it we could just cut this film down you know I mean just trim it <laughs> uh we'll just take the dialogue and have like a 45 minute short uh, of the scenes only where Leslie is talking to somebody. <laughs> no, there are a lot of scenes in this film where uh, somebody decided to to do like an establishing shot for a long period of time, or maybe we're watching one of the characters do something. I have no idea, but it was maddening. It's a it's a it's a large chunk of the film that's unwatchable uh, because you you don't know what it is that's going on. However. Uh, I was able to follow the basic plot. The plot is pretty obvious. Uh, a woman wins. Uh, a woman who probably should never be given money and wasn't ready to be given a large sum of money wins a rather small lottery, if we're being totally honest, but like 190000 I mean, like, yes, I would love to be given $190,000, but, uh, I mean, we see these lottery alerts nowadays and people are getting like a billion dollars. So, yeah, it's... It's a little bit different. Um, so she gets like $190,000 and she wants, she has all these big dreams about like buying a house and opening a restaurant and her kid wants a guitar and it's just like this really simple life and then we cut, we flash forward. We don't get to see how necessarily that all fell apart. We just flash forward to the fact that it did fall apart and her life didn't come to fruition the way that she had expected and she kind of blew the money and she's an alcoholic and she's a train wreck of a person. And, um, she's falling apart and her son is tired of taking care of her. And he has this really great speech where he's like, I'm not even 21. I have to take care of my, I can't even drink myself, you know? Uh, and it's, I mean, like most of us drank before we were 21, but, uh, you know, I, I, so, so I, I was slightly sympathetic to what he was saying, but come on now. Anyway, um, <laughs> so yes it's a it's a fantastic performance and it goes throughout the whole film and actually everybody who's in this film as a main character is fantastic uh that's the problem that i have now with the film is had the film had equal consideration we might actually be talking about things like should mark Marin be up for supporting actor should allison janney be up for supporting actress um, there's some really good performances here. It's not just Andrea Riseborough. I know that it feels like it is, but it's sort of like that conversation that people have with Tar, where people were like, ooh, well, maybe Nina Haas will get in. Cool. Well, maybe Mark Maron will get in, or maybe uh, Alice and Janney will get in. If this film had been given equal consideration along with everything else, we might be talking about the multiple nominations this film had. It's good enough. I believe that if this film had had an audio description, I would have given it an A. I don't really see a problem with it other than the lack of accessibility and the fact that there are some moments where I'm just like, I have no idea what's going on. And I hate films like that, and I can't give a film an A where I'm just like, I, where for like a third of the film, at least a quarter, if not a third of the film, I had no idea what was going on. Um, it's a very quiet, understated movie when it wants to be. And then in other times, it uses Leslie as a wrecking ball of just shouting and entering the room with the most amount of energy humanly possible. Um, and, you know, just the life of the party. She's still the life of the party, even though after all of this time, uh, her life is definitely not where she's wanted it to be, but she's trying to put on this face and, uh, and pretend. Uh, and somehow... Um, Alice and Janney, who's also supported by Stephen Root, who I swear to God has, like, no dialogue in this film, um, or his voice was totally unrecognizable to me, because I've heard Stephen Root do, like, a thousand things, and I don't, I don't know, maybe he has three lines, I had a hard time finding an actual performance from Stephen Root, um, but, 
uh, it's Janney does most of the talking out of out of that set of performances, um, and uh, they're you know they're really resistant to her being there because they remember that she left and and was a train wreck of a person and they're not so quick to forgive. But uh, Leslie meets up with this guy that runs a hotel, and he gives her a job. Uh, gives her a place to stay, and she's able to sort of work on herself and work on resetting her life. And it's weird how this person sort of just gives her an opportunity and a chance. And it kind of reminds me of like how many indie films we've had this character in. You know, the character that sees somebody who clearly just needs to be given a chance and uh, does so. And um, those performances are usually really emotionally re resonant. Uh, for for one reason or another, and I think Mark Maron here did a fantastic job, and I would love to see him in an in an Oscar campaign. Uh, it's a shame that he didn't get one. He, it reminded me a lot of. Um, I'll compare it to uh, Into the Wild, uh, where yeah, the film was not about him, but Hal Holbrook comes in with this really heartwarming performance, uh, and just stunned everybody with this sort of. Uh, you know, I accept you, uh, I, I wish you would stay, um, type person. And I think that's kind of what I see a lot of Mark Maron's character in, is that sort of same vein, um, here. So it's, um, it's a great performance. And if, like I said, if the film had been given a real Oscar campaign, we, uh, he might have been talked about or gotten some supporting actor nomination somewhere or somewhere along the way. It's weird that he had to ha host a podcast to support Andrea Riseborough instead of being able to support himself. Like, why does why did this film only end up supporting one person? Um, so that's where, yeah, that's, I mean, it's just this whole conversation I want to have with uh, the Academy about how their system is broken and isn't working. Uh, but, you know, every once in a while they do. They pick up, they get an Aftersun, but hey, you know what? Aftersun is backed by A24. So even though, like, hardly anybody had seen Aftersun, it had a major studio behind it. It had the same studio as Everything Everywhere All at Once. So is it really that shocking? I've never heard of the distributor of To Leslie until I saw To Leslie. I've never heard of Momentum Films. I don't know what that is. I've never heard them release a film before. I was, I was, hey, it's out there. You know, it's not the kind of film where I'm like, oh, Momentum Films, they have a distribution deal with this streaming service where they're, I don't even know where it's going to go to stream. I, I, nothing. I've got nothing on this film. So I would not have known this film existed had Andrea not paid for her own Oscar campaign. So... That's where we're at. Um, do I recommend a film with no audio description? I don't know. Um, the thing is, I'm not being too hard. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, so she had to self-fund her own Oscar campaign. Fine. You know what? There are films, there's, uh, there's a, a film festival that's designed for uh, uh, filmmakers who are blind and visually impaired, and they, they believe it or not, they make movies. Um, and those films, of course, are incredibly low budget. Um, they don't have even the money I'm sure this film had, uh, to, to go to production. And those films have audio description. You know, I've seen some of the most basic things have audio description, things that have no budget. Somebody has made, uh, has found a way to hire someone to do audio description. Maybe not deluxe. But maybe they didn't get, like, the premium, premium job. But there are a lot of other audio description companies out there. Um, for example, the aforementioned A Love Song has a company that I've never heard of before. And a writer I've never heard of before. And a narrator I've never heard of before. So, but they made it happen. It was important enough to them. It was not important enough to, to Leslie. It was not important enough to Momentum Films. It was not important enough to the producers uh, of the film. And uh, that's a message that's being sent to me as a viewer. And if this was me voting, I would not vote for somebody uh, to win something who's coming from a film with no accessibility. 
food for thought. Um, no matter how great the performance is here, uh, if it's standing up against something else that was accessible, that's just as good, if not better, then fine, that wins. Accessibility is important. It doesn't matter how big or small the film. So I can't totally give you a pass, but I can say that yes, I was able to follow most of this film despite the many unnecessary sequences of I don't know what um, that that break up the dialogue scenes in this film. Uh, so I will be nice, and I'm not going to say this film is unwatchable because it's not. I'm going to give to Leslie an A minus. Um, I think this is a film that if they had put audio description on it, I would love it. I think it might even be in my top ten. Um, but unfortunately, there are, I can't put a film in my top 10 where there's like a third of it that I have no idea what's going on they could be cutting to like a clown dancing in a field I have no fucking idea no idea what's going on in those scenes so <laughs> it's just it doesn't it, it's that's what happens when you when you have no accessibility I have to draw my own conclusions so I'm just like okay well sound um so but uh I do feel like I got the general grasp of the plot and that is what I'm talking about watchability versus unwatchability um, I felt like I knew what the core story was here uh, so that's it that's my review thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for watching this thanks for subscribing I know this is, I don't know I don't know what time I'm at in this film I just review how long this is but thank you uh please subscribe so we can continue to talk about films of audio description and hold the ones to the fire that don't have it um even if they're this lovely little film <laughs> so uh yeah it's uh also the website macmovieguy.com you can go to the audio description project adp.acb.org it'll let you know what has audio description and where you can watch it in case you want to watch something with audio description which is totally fair you can follow me on twitter and instagram at macmovieguy and you can go to the adna.org and look up your favorite films and television series there and see who's narrating them that's it for me today i will review something else for you and see you on the other side